Hi, welcome to the Insight Channel, your user's guide for living life with vision loss. I'm Jazz, I'm a blind occupational therapist, and I'll be your guide. Has your doctor talked to you about your vision impairment? I mean really talked to you so you understand what's going on? Well, that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to discuss some common terminology, how the eye works, and the four leading causes of vision loss in America today. So let's start by talking about the terminology. Blindness. Blindness can be used as an umbrella term to explain anything from low vision to no vision. However, when you're talking about someone being truly blind, completely blind, then it's a condition in which a person does not have object or light perception and cannot use any vision to perform their daily tasks. Legal blindness is a common term that carries a lot of weight. Anytime you put the word legal in something, it's gonna make it sound really super important. But I bet you'll be surprised to know what it actually means. Legal blindness refers to criteria that is established by the federal government to determine when a person's vision impairment qualifies them for benefits and services. That's it. That's all it stands for. Is your vision impairment significant enough to receive government benefits and services? That's all it means. So please don't let the word legal blindness or the term legal blindness make you feel that you're losing your vision or you can't see anymore or things are hopeless. Don't give those words that much power. They don't deserve it. All it means is that you might be able to benefit from some government support. The next term that's common is low vision. What the heck is low vision? How is that defined? What does it mean? Low vision refers to a condition where you have significant enough loss in your vision that it's getting in the way of you performing your daily activities. And it cannot be corrected by medical or surgical interventions, but you still have some vision to work with. So, how is it defined? How is it measured? Well, it's measured by looking at different components of vision. There are many different things that happen in the eye that allow us to see what we're seeing. Today I'm going to talk about six components that are uh, strongly affected by the four leading causes of vision loss in America. That's our visual acuity, visual field, contrast sensitivity, glare modulation, ocular motor control, and visual perceptual skills. So these are all six different types of vision coming through your eyes and any given condition can affect these components and affect the way you're seeing. So by the end of this episode today, you should have a general understanding of why you're seeing the pattern of vision loss that you may be seeing. So let's start by talking about acuity. Acuity is the level of vision impairment that is most easily measured. So you're gonna hear that the most. Oh, what's your vision? My vision's 2060. If you have normal vision, what's that? 2020. Everybody knows those numbers, right? But do you really know what they mean? So when we say that someone has quote unquote normal vision, that would be for a human at 2020. That means at 20 feet, a person with normal vision will be able to see a particular object clearly. So acuity is the measure of clarity, our ability to see details clearly from a particular distance. So if you have, let's say, 2080 acuity, what does that mean? That means that what you are seeing at 20 feet, someone with normal vision would see at 80 feet. You wanna hear that again? I'll take it one step further. To be considered legally blind, you need to have your best corrected acuity at 2200, 20 slash 200, or 20 degrees of field loss. So 
What does 2200 mean? That means that if your acuity is 2200, what you can see clearly at 20 feet, a person with normal acuity could see at 200 feet. So that's what those numbers mean. Now you can have distance, we all have distance acuity and then we have near vision acuity. Nowadays it's very common to have to have glasses that have different thicknesses depending on if you need to see far or need to see near. So you have bifocals and you even can have trifocals nowadays because you need to be able to see far, you need to be able to see close, and you need to be able to see a computer screen. So these all have to do with acuity and getting lenses to refract, refract, blah, 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 refract light into your eye so that you can get your best clarity to see at these three different distances. So we're gonna move on to visual fields. So visual fields have to do with your peripheral vision, and that is your side vision and your top and bottom vision. So when we're looking at peripherals, it is defined by what you see in a single view without moving your eyes. So if you look straight ahead without moving your eyes, you should actually be able to see 180 degrees from left to right and 130 degrees top to bottom without moving your eyes or your head. No cheating. When you go to the doctor, your doctor may put his hands behind your ears and say, let me know when you see my finger. Or he may shine a light and say, let me know when you see the light. Then that's what he's looking for. He's looking to see if your side vision or your top and bottom vision uh, is intact or what degree of loss you may be working with. If you have retinitis pigmentosa or glaucoma, these are conditions that uh, where you start to see loss of this peripheral vision. So that explains what the doc's doing when he puts his fingers behind your ears. The next one is contrast sensitivity. Now this is not often measured by your doctor, but it can significantly affect your level of function. So contrast sensitivity refers to our ability to distinguish between various shades of light and dark. We all know that black and white is the highest form of contrast. That is the easiest uh, comparison to see. But we don't live in a black and white world. We live in a world that's full of millions of shades of color and texture. And so when there are changes in our eyes, that diminish our ability to distinguish between these different shades of light and dark, it can be debilitating. You need at least 70% of contrast sensitivity to be able to see facial expressions, to see cracks in the sidewalk, to read the newspaper, and even to distinguish cash or money. So if you're having problems with contrast sensitivity, be sure to tell your doctor. Now, if you see an, a low vision specialist or low vision occupational therapist, uh, there are um, tests that we do to help um, determine your level. The fourth component is glare modulation. There are many systems in the eye that are specifically put in place to regulate the amount of light coming into the retina because too much light can be damaging to our eyes. It can also be very painful and keep us from going outside on a bright sunny day or keep us from doing activities that we love. So glare modulation refers to our eyes ability to control the amount of light that is that is coming through into the retina. And there are many ways that you can get the light you need but still modulate what's coming through. And we're gonna go through that on another episode when we talk about uh, solar shields, filters, and things you can do around your home to make sure you've got the right light for your eyes and how they work. The next one's ocular motor skills. Each eye has six muscles that allows us to per perfectly move them where they need to be. This is what allows us to fixate on a single object, track that object as it moves, 
and be able to jump our eyes from left to right, right to left, as needed to see our environment. If the muscles that control our eyes, um, if we're not able to control them, then it's very difficult for us to be able to get the information we need from our environment. Can you imagine driving if you can't control your eye movements? Any dynamic activity that involves movement of some kind would be difficult if we can't control our eye muscles. So the sixth component I'm going to talk about today is visual perceptual skills. This is our brain's connection to our eyes. So the eye is, acts like a camera. It brings in light, processes it, and shoots the information on up to the brain where the brain makes sense of it. So even if our eyes are completely healthy and working as a quote-unquote normal eye should work, if there is something going on in the brain to keep it from interpreting that information, then we're not going to be able to make sense out of our environment. Uh, things like being able to tell foreground from background, um, being able to understand when there's lots of <clears throat> movement or visual clutter, being able to make heads or tails out of the images that we're seeing, knowing when something's right side up, upside down, knowing if two things look the same. You know, these are all things that our brain interprets from our eyes. And so we need our brain in good, healthy, working shape to interpret the information that our eyes tell it. So let's talk about the four leading causes of vision loss. Because any one of these four conditions is going to affect these components of vision loss in a different way. And I want you to understand why you're seeing what you're seeing through your eyes. So they are age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and cataract. Before I get into the detail of each of these four, I think we need to start with understanding how the eye works. The eye is an amazing organ. Every little piece's part is designed to allow light to come in, hit the back of the retina, be processed and shoot it to the brain, where over 50% of our brain is dedicated to understanding or processing visual information. It's an incredible system. And it all starts with the protective mechanisms of the eye. Our eyelids and our eyelashes. Our eyelids and our eyelashes actually have an important job. Their job is to keep debris from getting into our eye. Not just because it hurts when we get something in our eye. That's important too. But actually to keep debris from blocking light that needs to get through so that we can see what we need to see. So we blink to moisten our eye and to wipe away any dirt or debris that could possibly block the light from getting in. There is a thin tissue layer on the inside of our eyelids and across the eyeball itself called the conjunctiva. And the purpose of this is to secrete mucus and keep everything nice and moist, healthy, and feeling good. Then we have another uh, a system called the lacrimal drainage system. Now this is where we produce tears. The tears keeps our eyes moist, but again, their job is to get rid of any debris that could be blocking light from getting into our eye. It washes away the dirt to keep our eyes free and clear. And so this system creates the tears, distributes them, and then drains them on out so you can have nice clear vision. So moving on to now the mechanisms of the eye that actually allow us to take in and process light. It begins with the sclera. The sclera is the white part of the eye that we're all familiar with. This gives the eye its walls, its structure, and its shape. The front of the sclera has a round clear portion to let light in, and that's called the cornea. The purpose of the cornea is to direct light straight back 
to the center of the retina where we have our best point of vision. If you've ever tried shining light through a lens, you know that the shape of and thickness of that lens is going to determine where that light is directed. So think about how that applies to the cornea. The shape of your cornea is going to determine how light gets to the back of the eye. If your cornea is more flattened, it's going to treat light differently than if your cornea is more rounded. So the shape of your cornea is going to determine if you're nearsighted or farsighted. When you go to an optometrist, the optometrist is going to look at your cornea and work with lenses or glasses so that the glasses can help your cornea to guide the light where it needs to be, as close to the center of that retina as possible so you can get the best clarity that you can get out of your eyes. So behind, I'm gonna take the top of my little eyeball up here, behind the cornea, we've got the iris. The iris is the colored part of your eye. The purpose of the iris is to absorb extra light to keep it from going through and protecting the eye. The iris is full of pigment. The more pigment that it has, the darker the color of your eyes will be. Have you ever heard that people with blue eyes may have more uh, prevalence of eye conditions as they get older? Well, this is true, and that's because our blue-eyed babies don't have as much pigment as people who have dark brown eyes, for example. So their eyes are not as protected from the extra light getting through to the retinas. So all of you blue-eyed babies, be sure that you're wearing your sunglasses with UV protection when you go outside. And if you are find yourself squinting inside, that means you're having some problems modulating glare, and you should be considering some indoor protection for your eyes as well, which again, we'll cover in another episode. So what's behind the iris? Actually, before we get behind it, let's look at what's in the middle of the iris. We have the pupil. The pupil is the little black dot in the middle of our eye. This too has a goal to reduce the amount of light going into the eye for protection. So if we're in a very bright place, our pupil is going to get very, very small and constrict. So it's only letting in the light that you need to see and trying to block out the harmful light, all that extra light that's out there. If you go into a dark area, your pupil's gonna widen to let in as much light as possible so you can see the best that you can see in the dark. So now what's behind the iris? We're gonna take the front part of this off and ta-da! Right behind the iris is a little lens. Remember this when we talk about cataracts. The lens is made up of hundreds of thousands of little lens fibers that are perfectly arranged to allow light to shoot directly through and onto the retina. And again, the retina is where we get our best vision. That's where we get our detailed vision. So if anything happens to the lens, especially as we age and things start to change, it's going to affect the way the light is directed into the back of the eye. Okay, I'm gonna put our little lens down here and let's talk about the retina. Okay. Behind the lens, you have the vitreous cavity. That's the big open inner portion of the eyeball. It's full of a clear gel called vitreous gel. The purpose of the gel is to keep the path clear so that the light can go back to the retina in the back of the eye. So the retina now sits in the back of the eye and it is a collection of photoreceptors. There are two kinds, rods and cones, that make up the retina. You have more rods along the periphery, around the, the, edge, the back edges of the retina, and the purpose of the rods are to help us to see 
when it's uh, dark and it helps us to see movement. The cone's purpose is to give us our detailed vision and our ability to see color. So the cones function more in bright light. So these things are all mixed in with each other, but you have your highest concentration of cones in the center of the retina. Think of this little hill of, of, of uh, photoreceptors in the center of your retina. That is called the macula. Remember that when we talk about macula degeneration. So why do we have this concentration of cone cells? What does it do? It gives us our clarity, our detail, our ability to see faces, to read, to write, to do everything that we need to do. It is our clarity. So the very, very center of the macula, there is this little depressed pit called the fovea. The fovea is nothing but pure cone cells. So what does that tell us? It tells us that that little pit is where we get our best point of vision. This might as well have a bullseye painted on it because that's exactly where the eye wants the light hitting in the back of your eye. So when it comes through the cornea, goes through the pupil, goes through the lens, and hitting the retina, it's aiming for the fovea because once the light hits there, that's where you're getting your clearest vision. So now that we've talked about what's inside the eye, let's talk about the layers on the outside of the eye. Those photoreceptors need support. So there is a layer called the retinal pigment epithelium that gives the photoreceptors some support, something to attach to, and it also helps to clean up degenerated cells. Behind that, is the choroid layer. This is the vascular layer or the blood vessels that feed the retina. This is very important when we talk about um, macular degeneration a little bit later on. So the choroid layer is uh, between the epithelium and the back wall um, of the eye socket. It also contains a pigment called melanin melanin's job is to absorb any extraneous light coming through that might get in the way of the transmission of the image up to the brain. So as you can see from start through finish, there are parts of the eye designed to help absorb extra light and protect this retina from getting too much light so you can get clear vision that's sent up to the brain where it's interpreted. All of this is done through the second cranial nerve, or the optic nerve. This is made up of millions of axons that go to the brain. They do a lot of switching around back and forth up there. And once the information gets to the visual cortex, it's interpreted. But remember, over 50% of our brain is actually designed to interpret visual information. So the visual cortex is not the only place where visual information is interpreted in our brains. So any part of the eye or the brain that is kept from doing what it is designed to do can affect vision. So it's good for you to keep that in mind as we talk about the four leading causes of vision loss. The first one was macular degeneration. So we're gonna go back to the center of the retina, our macula, which has the highest concentration of cone cells. Do you remember what the job of those cone cells is? It's where we get our detailed vision, our best clarity. So with macular degeneration, you are going to um, see a deterioration of the cells in the macula. When that happens, it basically causes those cells to stop processing light. So what happens is you get a little fuzzy spot where the cell is that gets snuffed out. Think of a pixels on a television. When pixels on a television blow out, you get little fuzzy spots in the middle of your image. Similar thing happening in the macula. 
We call these fuzzy spots scotomas, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. But because it's in the macula, you're going to see a loss of central vision. You should still keep peripheral vision. It's just focused more in our central vision. The fovea, which is where we get our clearest point of vision, our best point of vision. Remember that, that little pit right there in the center of the retina? If we get scotomas that cloud over our best point of vision, the brain actually chooses a secondary best point of vision called the PRL or preferred retinal loci. What's important to know about this is the brain chooses a second best point of clarity, which is just amazing that it naturally does that, but it doesn't naturally know how to use that secondary best point of clarity. And that's where a low vision occupational therapist can come into the picture here. A low vision therapist can help you to find your secondary best point of vision and learn to use it to start to see around those fuzzy spots and move them out of the way so you can actually get more clarity out of your eyes. So that's part of the process with eccentric viewing and visual skills training that you would do in a vision rehab center with a low vision occupational therapist. Pretty cool, huh? So what's going on with this macular degeneration? Two things could be happening. If you have dry macular degeneration, there are deposits of drusen that are actually causing these cells to burn out, not be able to do their job. If you have wet macular degeneration, what's happening is that blood cells, remember the choroid layer, you've got blood cells behind the retina, well, they uh, may start to burst and bleed out. When that happens, that starts to affect the cells in the retina and you're going to see it centrally first your central vision your the vision that gives you clarity will be affected first but then if it's not gotten under control slowed or stopped then you could potentially also start to see loss in your peripheral vision as well that's why it's very important for you to listen to your doctor and to uh, seriously consider what your doctor is telling you you need to do to slow the progression of macular degeneration and keep your eyes healthy. So who is at the higher risk for having macular degeneration? It tends to be Caucasian populations of industrial countries. So that's the United States, right? This research has shown that things like smoking and pollution and sunlight and diet can make a difference on the health of our macula and can be a factor in macular degeneration. So think about this. Is your diet low in leafy greens, fish, fresh fruit and vegetables? Do you eat a lot of processed or prepackaged foods? If so, you can be contributing to the deterioration of your macula, which is in control of your detailed vision. So think about that. Look at your diet and talk to your doctor about your eye health and keeping your eyes healthy. So the next one we're gonna talk about is glaucoma. Now glaucoma presents itself differently than macular degeneration. It has to do with pressure in your eye. Think about, think about a balloon. When you blow up a balloon, the air is pressing on the inner walls of that balloon and pushing it outward. With glaucoma, most commonly open angle glaucoma, you have more fluid coming into the eye than going out at any given time. So that fluid is pushing and pushing and stretching on the eye. So what is lining that inner layer of the eye and getting the brunt of all this pressure? It's the little tender nerve fibers around that inner layer of the eye. 
And so when the nerve fibers get snuffed out because they can't handle that pressure, you're going to start to see your vision close in. It starts peripherally and closes in and closes in until you have tunnel vision, which is like looking through toilet paper tubes, or no vision. You can completely lose your vision with glaucoma if you're not careful. So please work with your doctor to slow or stop that progression. Take your drops every day. Look at your nutrition. Discuss possible laser treatments. It's important stuff. Who is at the higher risk? Tends to be more prevalent in the African American population over 40. So if you're 40 and in this population, be sure to get an annual checkup from your eye doctor to check the pressures in your eyes. Anyone over 60 should be getting their pressures checked every year, especially if you have a history, a genetic history, I should say, in your family of glaucoma. It also has a high prevalence in the Hispanic population over 65. So if you are of Hispanic descent, be sure you want to uh, get your pressures checked every year so you can uh, find out what's going on. Do not wait until you start to see symptoms or expect to feel pressure. It doesn't work that way. There are no visual ways of monitoring the onset of glaucoma and you will not feel the pressure in your eyes at all. If you start to notice that you've lost peripheral vision and you find that it's due to glaucoma, then unfortunately you're out of luck because with macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy, which I'm about to speak on, once the damage is done, it's done and it cannot be reversed. So you need to talk to your doctor, you need to follow your doctor's instructions and take it seriously because you want your eye to be as healthy as possible so you can maintain your vision for as long as possible. Once the damage is done, it's done and there's no bringing it back. So be very careful about this and research your eye condition so you know what's going on and you know what questions to ask. So let's move on to diabetic retinopathy. So what's going on with diabetes? When you have diabetes, one of two things is happening. Either your body isn't producing enough insulin or it's not effectively using the insulin that it has. Why do we need insulin? It metabolizes or breaks down the sugars in the foods that we eat. That's important because if sugar goes through our bloodstream without being metabolized, it's like an acid going through our system and it starts to harm our blood vessels. Think of it this way. I'm a very visual person. I know God's little irony. I'm blind, but I'm a visual person. So let's, let's picture it this way. Think of sugar in your bloodstream as an acid. As it goes through the blood vessels, which blood vessels are going to get affected the most and the soonest? It's going to be the small, tender, fragile little blood vessels, right? Where do those exist? They exist in places like our fingertips, where we have, we're very sensitive. They're in our toes and feet. They're in our body organs. And they're definitely in our eyes. So. Diabetic retinopathy is the only uh, common eye condition that doesn't have a specific pattern of vision loss like you see with macular degeneration or glaucoma. Because the blood vessels can be affected at any multi multitude of patterns from person to person, there's no way to determine uh, what's going to change visually. So no two people with diabetic retinopathy are going to be seeing the same thing through their eyes. That's just how it works. You could have central vision loss. Your friend could have peripheral vision loss. You could have a third person who is seeing double or someone seeing flashing lights or someone seeing spots in their vision. 
or someone who has no vision. Diabetic retinopathy can cause visual changes that are severe and can happen very quickly. And again, it cannot be reversed. So it is crucial for you to take your diet seriously, watch your sugar levels, monitor your insulin, and listen to your doctor so that you can keep your eye healthy and preserve the vision that you have left. 40 to 45 percent of people with diabetes will develop some form of diabetic retinopathy. So do your research and take this one very seriously. I like to end on cataracts. Cataracts, let me get my lens here, if you remember, they have the happy ending. They have to do with the lens. The lens sits between the iris and the vitreous cavity and its job is to shoot light directly to the retina in the back of the eye. Well, as we age, things start to break down and with the lens in our eye is no different than some of those other body parts that are starting to break down. What happens with the lens is it can thicken, it can yellow, it can get fuzzy spots in it and that is going to affect your vision because it's affecting how the light is traveling through the eye. Think of it as light going through a dirty windshield. Um, is it going to come straight through in a nice clear path? Of course not. It's going to bounce all over the place. It's going to be glary and quite annoying. So that's what's going on if you have cataracts in your lens. You may have difficulty seeing things at a distance at first and then eventually ha having trouble seeing things up close. Um, you may have difficulty distinguishing color or seeing at night or seeing details. Um, you may also just not be able to find that right prescription glasses. You keep changing your glasses frequently. These are all signs that you may have cataracts. So go to your eye doctor. They'll take a nice bright light and look into the back of your eye where they can see your cataracts. Good news is that most cataracts uh, can be removed so you can get clear vision again. So that is the happy ending to the story of the four causes of vision loss. So now you've got insight on how it works. If you have any questions about your specific eye condition related to anything I talked about today, be sure to write them down. Do a little extra research. Get all your questions together so when you go to the doctor, you are prepared and can get those questions answered. The more information you have, the better equipped you're going to be to preserve your remaining vision. And remember, if you're having difficulty doing your daily activities because of your vision loss, ask your doctor for a referral to a vision rehabilitation center in your area. That's where you have low vision occupational therapists, certified low vision therapists, orientation and mobility specialists, access technology, sorry, access technology specialists, and other specialists whose job is to help you to do what you need to do to meet your goals, to be independent and to be safe and to get the most out of your remaining vision. So if you like this episode today, click the thumbs up at the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video with anyone you know who is experiencing vision loss. If you have any ideas, comments, questions, reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Remember, my job is to help you to make this look good. So no worries, you got this. See you next time.